Cancer is the world's second leading cause of death, responsible for one in six deaths each year. It's a devastating disease that touches many people's lives. We know that the best way of improving someone's chances of surviving cancer is to diagnose it early. Your current tests that screen for cancer are often invasive and unpleasant. It can be expensive and some tend to only identify late stages of cancer. These factors mean that many people are not being tested and receiving that all important early diagnosis. Our mission is simple. We want to save lives. We're developing easy to use routine blood tests that help screen for cancer. With this, we aim to revolutionize the way cancer and other diseases are diagnosed. Our mission is simple. We want to help save lives. We are aiming to revolutionize the way cancer is diagnosed. And together, we're committed to solving early diagnosis of cancer. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our 2020 Capital Markets Day, which is obviously being held virtually for the first time. So this is a new format for us, and one which will keep much shorter than the ones we've had in person. We'll attempt to keep it between one and one and a half hours, given all the things we've got to discuss. I think you'll all be happy with that. And I think we've got a lot to talk about, but we're gonna to focus today on uh, the process we have for launching the first products. We wanna keep it simple. Where can we launch products and what can we do, do during the pandemic? I'll start with going through the agenda and then we have the process of the vet side. Uh, Dr. Wilson Robles will go through the technology itself, why she as a professor at Texas A&M uh, why she's been developing it and why she thinks it will be a good for veterinarians to use. And also Dr. Michelle will tell us product rollout going forward as the vet product. And I'm very happy to say today we're on target at the moment for the launch this year. So you'll have a lot more news on that coming up. And also we're, uh, next we have Dr. Terrell who will be telling us about the same cancer, the blood cancers, which have worked so well in dogs and our plan for launching them in humans. Um, it's very interesting to say that we're getting extremely similar results in dogs as in humans, and dogs are just much easier to launch in the short term, and we have a plan now for the US market in humans, and also I'm very happy to say today, we have our first C marked product now available for the blood cancers. And next, uh, once we've done all that, I'll do a summary of where we are and moving forward and we'll end with Q&A and a summary at the end. And the questions will come from our covering analysts. So uh, it should be a good hour, hour and a half, and thank you very much for joining us. I'll start with our pandemic focus. So of course, during uh, COVID, we've been very careful to keep our team uh, safe and also working, which has been great. Our lab in Belgium has not closed for one day. Uh, we had a small closure in Texas A&M, um, but Belgium has stayed open the complete time and th those of us who can work have been working remotely. So yet again, I think we've done a, a very, very good job of keeping things going during COVID. Uh, we've also worked very hard to strengthen our balance sheet and secure the supply of our key components, which I'll get to at the end. And I think uh, we looked very carefully strategically on what we can do during COVID, what we can't, and we decided uh, it sh we should really focus on simplicity. The things that we can do, which are ready, product ready, and that we can do during COVID. So of course, uh, the vet side is a very key one. Uh, the COVID side is also very key, um, but I'll update a lot more on that in the queue uh, and a little bit today. And I'd also like to reiterate very strongly, uh, we're still very serious about our marquee lung and colorectal cancer programs in humans, and we'll have an update on that in the queue. But of course, that's just a bit more difficult during the pandemic as uh, they've been requiring much larger panels to get the accuracy we need. And I think we've been very nimble and we've kept the operations going. And I'd like to thank yet again, our team for really, really, really working hard during this time to make sure we stay on track and we adapt and we can really deliver all the milestones we've been working on. As I said, we've also worked very hard to secure our supply during, uh, of the key components during COVID. 
and I'm very happy to say yet again we've met our milestone and the lab, uh, the new facility, Silver One, is about to open in Namur and we'll have full updates on that when it happens. Just a reminder, this is going to be our, uh, the hub for production of our products, also for uh, products components when we license and also selling those components to other people for other uses as well as a contract research uh, facility to also help drive revenue and provide a hub for the epigenetic research that we do for other people. So we're also in the process of hiring our first sales manager there, which is very close, and we should be able to announce that soon as well. So yet again, another key milestone on uh, the path to launching product. Um, just a quick one on the COVID side, it's potentially an opportunity to help. Uh, we're really excited with the data we've had so far from uh, the COVID. Quick explanation, um, we measure chromatin fragments in cancer. The mechanism which actually kills you in COVID in the vast majority of cases is called NETS, N-E-T-S, and it's, it's long chains of chromatin the body throws out trying to trap and kill the virus, which is good if it kills the virus, but what happens, it can be a real big feedback loop, a cytokine storm, which produces more and more of this, which clogs up your lungs and other organs. So um, our assays uh, measure chains, individual ch chunks of chromatin and therefore uh, chains of chromatin. And we think it's very helpful as a prognostic, not do you have COVID, but how sick are you going to become from COVID? So there's three levels to the trial. The first one was very successful. Can we measure COVID from healthy? There's no point doing this if it doesn't measure COVID. We had 98% success, which was fantastic. The next step is could we tell uh, different signals from how sick you are? And that worked out extremely well. So now we're just seeing longitudinal samples from the same people to see how it progresses. Very happy to say we have secured the longitudinal retrospective samples, which will be running soon. And we have just finalizing the details of two fantastic prospective studies um, in the US and in uh, Europe. Um, why prospective, why bother? Uh, we think obviously COVID is very important. But netosis looks to be an incredibly important part of a huge number of other conditions, uh, things like sepsis, things like influenza. The mechanism that kills you in COVID is the same mechanism that kills you in those. So we'd expect to uh, have a lot more news on all of that coming up. And I think it probably warrants a separate um, capital markets call sometime in the next few months to update you on all of that. It's very exciting. We're making great progress and we'll update you on all of that as it comes up. And I think it's going to be a key part of what we uh, do going forward as well. So just a, a quick <clears throat> review of why we're doing what we're doing it for, why we're doing it now. Again, during COVID, we just want to keep things simple, things that we can launch now. So we identified the blood cancers in dogs, huge market, ready to go, much smaller trials than needed in humans. And we have fantastic partners uh, in Texas. So all of that. Uh, the blood cancers are new. Uh, Dr. Trell will go through the, the great results and why he thinks it's a great test and how it can become a product in the US just with a 510K study, which can be done a lot quicker than the PMA studies we're needing to do in colorectal. And also, of course, the COVID side, which I've mentioned. And again, we have a C marked for the, for the human blood product and we're looking to launch a range of different products as I have outlined. So I'd uh, like to pass it over to the now Professor Wilson Robles, who congratulations on your promotion, uh, on, your, on your professorship. And uh, she will outline the product from the veterinary side and the scientific side of why she thinks it, it's a great product and why vets will use it. Heather? Thank you, Cameron. I appreciate that introduction. Good morning. My name is Dr. Heather Wilson Robles. I'm a medical oncologist at Texas A&M uh, College of Veterinary Medicine, and I also serve as the chief medical officer for Volition. And this morning, I'm really excited to talk to you about some new data that we recently presented this past weekend at the Veterinary Cancer Society meeting uh, regarding the use of the Veterinary Volition product, the cancer screening test, in uh, two very common cancers that we see in dogs, both lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma. So similar to humans, there is no just general blood test for cancer. Um, and it makes it hard to diagnose. And in dogs, it's even a bigger problem because you have to wait for the owner to actually notice there's something wrong or the veterinarian finds something incidentally at their uh, exam, annual exam. And so for that reason, um, we generally don't detect cancer in these dogs until it's pretty late in the disease process. 
And then to confirm that cancer, a lot of times we have to do pretty invasive tests, things like biopsies um, and aspirates, or we have to do expensive tests like imaging, so CAT scans and MRIs in order to identify the cancer and diagnose it further. Um, and for that reason, I think there is a huge unmet need in our canine population uh, to actually come up with some sort of blood test that will help us better identify cancer in these guys. Proteins like PSA and things like that just don't exist in the veterinary world. And so we've taken a look at nucleosomes. And what are nucleosomes? Well, you can't talk about nucleosomes without talking about the genome. The genome is about 3 billion base pairs long. So that's your string of DNA. And if you were to unwind it out of a cell, it would be over five feet long. And how is that condensed so much into these tiny microscopic chromosomes within the nucleus of your cell? Well, one way that happens is through making nucleosomes. And nucleosomes, if you can imagine, they're basically a disc shaped structure that almost look like pearls on a string. And what they are is they're an octomer, so eight histones that are stacked on top of each other uh, in sets of, of four duplicates, kind of like spools. And you've got about a 150 base pair section of DNA that's wrapped around those spools, and that sort of gives you that pearl or that disc, and that condenses that DNA down to a smaller uh, footprint, which then gets condensed further into your chromosomes. Now, these nucleosomes are very important because not only do they carry your DNA, but they carry a large number of modifications that actually control a lot of what happens within the cell. So what happens in the cell? Well, they're responsible for saying what genes get expressed and what genes get silenced. So every cell carries the same amount of DNA as every other cell, but some cells help you grow your hair and other cells determine your eye color and some are skin and some are muscle. What makes those cells different is what genes are actually being expressed um, or what genes are being silenced or turned off. And nucleosomes play a huge role in that by allowing access to the DNA or not. They're also important to provide structure during DNA damage repair, as well as replication. So I've just talked to you all about nucleosomes being in the chromosomes in the nucleus, but I said we're gonna be measuring them in the blood. Well, how do we do that? During certain disease states like cancer, sepsis, inflammation, trauma, a bunch of cells die. And when those cells die, that chromosome, uh, the chromatin basically gets fragmented and then released into the blood. And it's very easy for them to sort of snip those off at the pearls. So if you can imagine these sort of scissors cutting those beads off as they come along and those nucleosomes get released whole into the serum or plasma in the blood. And so we can actually measure those nucleosomes uh, through a variety of methods. What's really interesting about them is, again, they carry so many modifications that are specific to the cells that they come from uh, that we can actually measure, say, a cancer-specific nucleosome or one specific to inflammation based on what they look like, what they have, the tags hanging on their surface. And so measuring nucleosome levels in the circulation has been shown to be prognostic uh, in dogs with sepsis, so uh, in basically a systemic infection um, and trauma. In people, they've, been, they've already started using nucleosome levels in the serum to diagnose cancers such as colorectal cancer, as well as prognostication. However, in dogs, as of yet, no one's really looked at the nucleosome compartment in animals with cancer until now. So how does this work? How are we actually able to measure these nucleosomes? The good news is we're able to use a very easy, very simple platform that is easy to modify. And that's very important. We use a standard ELISA, which is basically taking an antibody that is stuck to the bottom of a plate. It's specific for nucleosomes. A nucleosome goes by, it grabs it. We then take a second antibody that has a signal on it. It waves and says, hello, I've bound a nucleosome that attaches to the other side. Because of that signal that waves, we can actually measure the amount, so a true concentration of nucleosomes in the sample that we're testing. And the nice thing about it is this nucleosome with the signal can be modified. So we can have one that's specific for a certain type of cancer or specific for a certain modification, or as in this assay, have one that's just specific for the nucleosome, the intact nucleosome as a whole. And so that's what we've used to measure our nucleosome levels in our canine patients.
So what we ultimately did was we collected samples from a variety of dogs. We had uh, some that came from Texas A&M. So they were healthy dogs coming to primary care. They belonged to staff members. My own dog back here in the corner participated, um, as well as cancer patients that came into our service, the oncology service, which I run here at Texas A&M. And so ultimately uh, we ended up adding to that number uh, using uh, samples that we got from the National Cancer Institute's Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis uh, biorepository. So they have a bunch of canine cancer samples and we use some of those as well. Ultimately we collected about 134 normal healthy animals of a variety of breeds and weights and genders. Um, as well as 73 dogs with mangiosarcoma and 127 dogs with lymphoma. Again, variety of breeds, weights, and genders, as well as a variety of cancer stages for us to look at. Samples were collected based on a paper that we published earlier this year, which looks at an optimal way to collect these samples for our test. And so we were making sure that the samples were as good as they possibly could be so that our results can be as good as they possibly could be. And now, if you look at our normal levels here, what you can see is the healthy dogs have a very consistent level of nucleosomes. And so that's really tight, really nice. Every dot represents a case um, or a, a healthy dog. And they're all really close together um, right there at the bottom. So they have very low levels of nucleosomes when they feel good. Moving into the data we got from the dogs with lymphoma, I think you can see there is a big difference between these guys. So this graph over here on the left is basically showing you the healthy dogs. You can see how tight the normal uh, values are. They're just right down there at the bottom, all clustered together. However, our lymphoma dogs have a much bigger variety of nucleosome levels in their blood, and some even as high as six and 7,000 uh, nanograms per microliter, which is uh, about 20 times what our normal dogs have. This chart on the left sort of, it's the same data, but it's presented in a way that you can see that variability. Um, if you remember our healthy dogs, which I showed you on the previous slide, the maximum level on the left side of the chart only went up to 600 nanograms per mil. However, we're having to go up to 6,000 on this side uh, because there is such a wide variety. So we took that data and we said, if we were to try to use this as a test to differentiate healthy dogs from dogs with lymphoma, how good would this test be? And so the best way to do that is to generate a receiver operator characteristic curve, which is what you see here. And a perfect test would be an exact right angle. So the line would go all the way up to the one and straight over. And the line in the middle means your test is no good. It's not going to differentiate between the two. Uh, if you look here, you can see we're pretty far away from that middle line, which is good. Um, our area under the curve is 87.3%. What that means is that we're able to detect the vast majority of lymphomas here pretty well. And so if we set a cutoff level, um, of 67.4 nanograms per mil in the blood of these dogs, what we find is that we our test is 100% specific and 74% sensitive. So we will, everybody we catch will have lymphoma. We might miss a few that are on the low end, uh, but we're gonna catch them if they have lymphoma and their levels are above 67.4. When we get into the hemangiosarcoma patients, the data gets even better. And so if you look here, what you'll see again, that healthy group of dogs is really tight and low there at the bottom, but our hemangiosarcoma cases are even more spread out and there's even fewer of them that sit in that lower range that could be confused with a healthy dog. Um, and so again, on the right side of the chart here, I think you can see a lot more variability here. Uh, these guys are, generally have a high level of nucleosomes even at the early stages of their disease. And so we have our rock curve here and you can see it's almost that perfect curve with that exact right angle. Uh, and so when we go back to that same cutoff of 67.4 nanograms per mil, what we find is not only is our specificity 100% still, but our sensitivity has jumped up to 89%. So this is a pretty fantastic test for a disease, which actually is pretty difficult to diagnose. And the reason for that is it likes to bleed spontaneously, and it tends to occur in internal organs where spontaneous bleeding could be life-threatening. So an example is we may see a large mass in the spleen, and there are situations where that mass could be benign, but there are also situations where that mass could be cancer. 
if you could do a simple blood test to differentiate between the two, then maybe you don't have to put that animal through a major surgery um, or uh, uh, chemotherapy or other, other tests that can be uh, pretty difficult uh, for them to go through. Additionally, the prognosis for a dog with hemangiosarcoma is not very good. And so for an owner to make a decision about wanting to spend the money going forward with the test uh, or spend the money going forward with treatment, it may be important for them to know whether their dog has a very serious and grave illness or whether this is more of a benign lesion. So in conclusion, based on these data, we know that the veterinary cancer screening test can be used to measure nucleosome levels in dogs. We know that the healthy dogs have consistently low levels uh, throughout, regardless of age, sex, gender, or breed, and that our dogs with lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma really tend to be a lot higher and that we're pretty good at differentiating between those two. We do recommend this cutoff of 67.4 nanograms per mil for our test, and we think with that, we're going to catch the majority of cases that come through. So an additional use for this test, we thought, you know, if this is good at detecting cancer, maybe it's good at determining how well our treatments are working and monitoring cancer. So we've started recruiting dogs for a longitudinal assay where we take samples from them when they're first diagnosed, and then we repeatedly take those samples as we move on uh, through their treatments to see, can we predict when they're responding and when they're not? And the, an the answer is, yeah, we're pretty good at that. So we've only got a few examples here, and I'm going to show you two, but we're pretty excited about this data. What you can see on the left, Cujo is one of our lymphoma patients. And when he first came out of remission, he was diagnosed a while ago. When he first came out of remission, his nucleosome levels were quite high. They were well over 500. We initiated treatment with chemo. And you can see that the level starts to drop down. Unfortunately, he developed some toxicity that required us to change his protocol. So we switched to a different set of drugs. Unfortunately, those drugs didn't work. And you can see that the nucleosome levels have actually come back up initially. Um, but with time, repeating those drugs over and over again, he did finally go into remission. And you can see that at his last checkup at the end of August, he was still in remission and his levels were down to a normal level. Now we ran these next to CRP, which is C-reactive protein, which has been used to look at signs of inflammation and measure systemic inflammation in dogs. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't actually measuring inflammation or inflammation caused by the die-off of cancer. We wanted to make sure we were truly measuring cancer response. And I think you can see here, the CRP has no correlation with what our nucleosome levels are doing in these dogs. The chart on the right, is from one of our hemangiosarcoma patients, Otis. And again, he had been diagnosed a while before and was in remission. Uh, when he came out of remission, again, his levels were above 600 uh, nanograms per mil, uh, so pretty high. Um, we started a lot of therapies. He got chemo and radiation and some other things. And you can see that over time, um, those therapies really were working and his nucleosome levels were dipping down pretty close to the normal range, which is around uh, 30 nanograms per mil. And so he got down to about 50, pretty darn close. Uh, but unfortunately, those levels started coming up. Now, what's really interesting in Otis's case is if you look at the February date, 226, he was noted to be in a complete remission based on a whole body CT. So based on imaging, uh, some of the best imaging we have available to us. However, those levels tell a different story. Once we actually got past that date, you, we were able to find the tumors that we could then see on imaging. However, the nucleosome levels predicted that recurrence two months before we were able to see it on imaging. We didn't run these at the same time. Uh, they were run after Otis unfortunately passed away at the end of May. We might have changed what we had done if we had known this information at the time. So moving forward, we're pretty excited about being able to use this assay with other cancers too. Now lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma make up about 30% of the cancers that we see maybe 35% of the cancers that we see uh, in my practice every day as a veterinary oncologist. But there are other cancers that this test is pretty, we think is gonna be pretty good for. And so we're excited to evaluate those further. Histiocytic sarcoma is another one, mast cell tumor, uh, and a few others. So we're, we're looking into those as we speak. 
Um, and then other species as well. We've been able to show that we can detect nucleosomes in cats and horses, uh, even some lions. So we're looking forward to looking at this in a variety of species. So this concludes the scientific portion of the presentation. We're excited uh, to show you the data that we presented recently at the largest veterinary cancer meeting, the Veterinary Cancer Society, uh, this past weekend. We've also uh, presented this data to a group of key opinion leaders and a key opinion roundtable to garner their support uh, and feedback based on this. So we are really moving forward, ready to launch this product. And with more information on that, I will pass this on. Thank you, Heather, for this uh, nice segue into this uh, product section of our uh, presentation. I am Gaetan Michel, CEO of Volition Veterinary and CEO of Belgian Volition. So I would like to start this presentation by saying how amazed I am with what the team has achieved in the past 12 months. So uh, indeed, the company was created in October 2019, and uh, we're a, a year ahead now. It's uh, amazing because we're starting to talk about a product launch already. So uh, thank you to, to all the team uh, members who have been uh, doing a phenomenal job at, um, at this. So if we start talking about the commercial opportunity that uh, the, the vet market rep represents, it is quite enormous because there's a, a little less than 80 million dogs in the US today. And out of those 80 millions, there's about 6 million which are diagnosed with cancer every year. And so if you compare that to the figures in the human space, it is quite impressive because there's only, well, there's about 1.6 million human diagnosed with cancer every year. So the ratio is about 3.5 to 4x um, in dogs compared to humans. And this really underlines the enormous opportunity that we will have with the products that we, we will put on the market. And so currently dogs suspected of having cancer are required to undergo a variety of diagnostic tests that may be expensive, time consuming, or painful for the animal. So Volition hopes to change this with the introduction of the new QVET cancer screening test. So it is a simple, low cost and easy to use ELISA-based screening blood test. It will help streamline the diagnostic process for up to a third of the malignancies in dogs and more specifically in lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma. Volition Veterinary has reason to believe that the product will be a great success because we have just shown that in a study of over 330 dogs, and if we put ourselves at 100% specificity, the new QVET cancer test can identify 74% of lymphoma and 89% of hemangiosarcoma compared to the control population. So these numbers are uh, phenomenal and, and much better than what the competition offers today. So the benefit for the vet, the owner and the dog itself is a streamlined diagnostic process, which is simpler, quicker, and less painful with the aim to detect cancer much earlier and aid the decision making and ultimately help to improve the quality of life of the animal. Our test launch plan is divided into five different steps. So the first logical step was to establish a lab facility in which we would run our test. And this lab is the, the GI lab from Texas A&M University. And I would like to thank Dr. Wilson Robles for the close relationship that she has and allowed us to uh, penetrate that, uh, that lab. And so the aim is to have that product uh, launched before the end of this year. The second step in our uh, test launch plan is to create awareness throughout the community, but is, it's also to develop credibility and use specialists, for example, to, mm -hmm. to help us. Another step will be to generate new trials within different indications, different pathologies to try and cover more cancer, for example, but also to cultivate advocacy in the same community. Our key customers are key opinion leaders, veterinary oncology specialists, GP veterinarians, and also at the end, the pet owners. 
So I will go through each of them uh, individually and try to, to, to give a bit of more uh, insights in those, uh, in those sections. So if we go back to the Key Opinion Leaders section, a couple of, couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we held a Key Opinion uh, round table. So this round table allowed to generate an expert-led report, which has been distributed at the VCS conference. Here's a video from the Key Opinion Leaders that share their thoughts. I think current barriers are really development of technologies that allow uh, the the accurate identification of of cancer specific biomarkers um, that that can be used uh, repeatedly, easily, and help uh, people make decisions on what they can do to help their pet. The importance of of having a test that diagnoses as cancer. Um, the, the really are twofold. One, can you detect cancer? earlier in such a way that you can take an action uh, that will result in extended quantity and quality of life for that particular patient. Uh, the second potential uh, use for um, uh, a, dete a cancer detection uh, assay would be uh, to use it once you've initiated therapy to one, determine whether your therapy is working in an in a, uh, easy way, easy and expensive way, and two, um, to determine whether you need to continue therapy, uh, and three, uh, to be able to pick up recurrence or spread of that cancer as early as possible so that you can hopefully manage it. I am so excited with what Volition shared with us today. I think this will be really exciting for our patients with lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma, both for diagnostics and potentially for monitoring during treatment. So I think the, the key things from the data that Volition has presented is that these are, these are promising results uh, to demonstrate that from, from normal dogs, you have a different signature compared to tumor-bearing dogs. Um, I think that as the technology continues to mature and the understanding of the disease also is better elucidated, I can only imagine that uh, this platform would uh, continue to um, gain strength in, in the market and the reproducible identification of specific tumors in dogs. I'm delighted that we will be collaborating with these KOLs and expanding our network nationwide, but also globally. If we now talk to uh, talk about veterinary oncology specialists, these these will really help us to develop the credibility of our products. And the first set we presented last week at the VCS conference, and we hosted a busy virtual exhibition stand. So it was really busy, and we were quite happy of the outcome of the of our first uh, virtual conference. Um, the second step is to uh, is to target the top 10 U.S. university hospitals and Texas hospitals through launch and learn sessions through November and December of this year. And Dr. Wilson Robles will be participating heavily in those sessions. And so the third and last step is to launch a marketing campaign with items including expert-led reports and product flyers. Now moving to um, GP veterinarians, we initially we will focus on Texas. So there's a little less than 5,000 in Texas, and that represents just about 10% of the U.S. market. So, so we think that this represents a large beta test market for us. And again, thanks to um, Dr. Wilson Robles, that uh, will reach out to most of them. And this will allow us to develop our tools and our products within that market. So this will be the focus, uh, the main focus for the year end and for early next year. As for the pen, pet owners, so that will come early again next, uh, next year, 2021, and we will start distributing simple leaflets to veterinarians that uh, will be able to share with the, uh, with the pet owners. And we will also have direct campaigns in 2021 once the product has been established in the, the veterinarian community. So as you can imagine, these are really exciting times for us because we're so close to the, the launch of our first veterinarian diagnostic product. And so as, as we've been saying for, for a couple of years, so we, we have developed our nucleosomics platform based on, on, on humans 
studies and we transfer that platform successfully into dogs. Uh, and we see now the correlation between humans and dogs is so significant that we're able to transfer back now from the work that we've been doing in dogs into humans. And I will now transfer to Dr. Jason Terrell, who's our chief medical officer, and he will now talk to you about the phenomenal work that we have done in blood cancer in humans. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Terrell. I'm the chief medical officer for Volition, and I'll be discussing the exciting work we're doing in blood cancers. I'll be reviewing the data we have to date, as well as talking about two studies we have planned for the near future. So some background information on blood cancer. There are 700,000 new cases diagnosed each year. And this includes the most common we see, including non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the acute myeloid and acute lymphoid leukemias. And these lead to approximately 415,000 deaths each year. And what's tricky about blood cancer is it often presents with nonspecific symptoms. And these can mimic much more common things like infection or autoimmune disease. So it's a tricky diagnosis and one which doctors are desperate for an, a tool to aid in the diagnosis. Here I'm going to review the results of the studies that we've performed to date. We have looked at 280 blood cancers, and these include non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the acute myeloid and lymphoid leukemias, compared to 144 healthy individuals. And the clinical question that we wanted to ask is, does our assay distinguish the blood cancers from the healthy population? And so far, we've seen that a single new Q assay, H3.1, produced excellent AUCs or accuracies that range from 85 to 88% for both newly diagnosed and total patients. And this was on both the manual plates and the automated IDS I-10 platform. The single largest and most recent study we've performed looked at 74 cases of newly diagnosed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma versus 72 healthy individuals. And here again, we saw that the single new QSA H3.1 detected 61% of the cancers if you set the specificity very high at 95%, and all the way up to 72% of cancers if you back the, spe the specificity down to 90%. And again, this is both the manual and the automated platforms. These results are so encouraging because they would be the single most accurate blood test it would help doctors make an early diagnosis. And this test is a little different in that we don't want to necessarily make the definitive diagnosis. For blood cancers, the definitive diagnosis will always be made by biopsy. What we want this test to do is give doctors very clinically useful and relevant information, allowing them to identify the patients who are at the highest risk for lymphoma or other blood cancers which will lead them to getting that biopsy that confirms the diagnosis earlier, allowing them to start treatment earlier. The first new study that we'll be talking about looks at non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and making the original diagnosis in pretreatment patients. And this is a U.S. regulatory trial, meaning it is purpose for FDA approval. And for this, we've selected a preeminent U.S. CRO who specializes in in vitro diagnostic oncology test studies. And we'll be enrolling close to a thousand patients looking at all eight most common and aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma subtypes. The total duration of the trial is 22 months, which includes the setup and the wrap up time periods. And again, we're looking at all eight most common aggressive subtypes. However, diffuse large B cell is by far the most common and it makes up about 35% of all cases. So because it's so much more common, we'll be able to enroll and accrue diffuse large B-cell patients much more quickly than we will the less prevalent subtypes. So we hope to be able to file our first Novo 510K with the FDA as early as 10 to 12 months into the study. At that time, we'll petition the FDA to accept subsequent 510Ks as we accrue statistically significant numbers of the more rare subtypes. The second study we'll talk about will be the first time Volition has looked at treatment response in any cancer. And for this, we're looking at diffuse large B cell treatment. As I said, diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common aggressive subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it's very good for a treatment monitoring study because it responds very rapidly to treatment. This means that over a short time period, we can get excellent results and evaluate the test very effectively. 
For this, we have hired a CRO who has already begun prospectively collecting 30 to few large B cell subjects. And they're going to be collecting over a six month duration, collecting six serial samples that correspond to each round of the standard chemotherapy regimen. The benefits of this study are that other types of blood cancers, other types of lymphomas and leukemias are treated very similarly to diffuse large B cell. So good results in this study will allow us to expand into other types of blood cancers. Also, as you know, we have a veterinary division of volition, and it just so happens that one of the most common cancers in dogs is lymphoma, which is genotypically and phenotypically almost identical to the diffuse large B cell subtype in humans. So the results of this trial will translate very nicely to what we're seeing in dogs. Well, that concludes the brief talk on blood cancers. I hope you found it interesting and I hope you stay tuned for much more exciting information, not only updates in blood cancer, but in also all the other human cancer work that we're doing, as well as the vet work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. And thank you very much, Heather and Gatan as well. Hopefully that was all very informative for the people listening. It's a very exciting time at the moment, and I think it's all come together after our 10 years now. Our vision of creating an epigenetics platform that can be used in a wide range of areas is absolutely coming to pass now. And I'm very excited that we're on the cusp of launching our first products. And I think we've handled it very well during the pandemic. We'll have uh, other Capital Markets Days coming up soon. I'm guessing on things like COVID as well as the other cancers. Uh, there's a lot going on, and I think this is a good way of keeping you all informed. So I'll now pass it over to our analysts for the questions. Thank you very much. First with the, uh, the COVID-19 project, um, you said you've got the longitudinal data in-house. Um, when do you think you might be publishing some of those results? Um, so yeah, we've been working on the prospective and retrospective, um, and we're getting bigger and bigger trials because as, as we've talked about, we think it's, I mean, obviously COVID is very important, um, but moving forward, uh, influenza, netosis, and all those other things are extremely important. So <clears throat> we now have in hand uh, the longitudinal samples. So we'll be running them very soon. Um, so expect to see that in the kind of short term. Um, and then there are prospective studies, which are in, in Europe and in US. We'll announce the full details of them after that process as well. So um, we're getting close to the, we should have enough data to launch the European product. Um, we were aiming sort of late this year, early next year. I think given all the, uh, the, the progress on the VET side, we're focused on the VET launch for, for late this year. But um, we should have some, uh, a lot of data coming up soon from the COVID side, and not just COVID, the whole Netosis platform. Uh, it's something we're incredibly excited with, and um, I think it's come across, coming through very well, and that'll be soon. Okay, great. And then my other question um, is about the VET program. So you're going to be starting in Texas um, Tell us a little bit more. You're going to be after that. Will you then um, try to roll out to the other um, vet reference labs like the Cornell Lab, etc.? And is it kind of a regional um, approach that you're going to take? Yes, absolutely, Bruce. So uh, we thought we'd start with the the experts, the clinical oncologists, get some really good key opinion leaders behind the test. And as you can see from our round round table, we've started that process already. And as you could uh, hear from, from themselves. Uh, it's something they're very happy with and, and working with us on. So um, it's good. There's only actually just over a thousand uh, veterinary oncologists in the US. So it's something you can really get it out to them. And we thought we'll start with one market to start with in Texas uh, in the first couple of months. Um, as you know, we have a very close relationship with Texas through Texas A&M. And um, I don't think you'd say it's a small market. Uh, there are about seven, seven and a half million dogs in Texas. So it's, uh, it's quite a big space already. Um, and then we'll roll out more reference labs and uh, start to blanket the entire United States. But with 77 million dogs, it's obviously a huge market. And so, yeah, so we're starting across the, the clinical oncologists and down in Texas. So um, we're not quite sure how long that would take to fully bring it, the Texan groups up to speed, but we think a couple of months. So certainly by the second quarter of next year, we, we want to start expanding to more and more states, more and more labs, perhaps sooner, depending on how that education process goes. But it's something we really want to get right. Uh, we've spent a huge amount of time on this platform and we want to roll it out in a range of different products from all the human cancers, all these cancers, things like COVID, as you know. So we want to get it right. So we're taking the time to really uh, educate the people who need to be educated. But it really should pick up speed through next year. And, and ultimately, we want uh, 
every uh, veterinarian in the US and a, and a wide, wide range around the world having access to this test. It really is uh, quite revolutionary in, in the veterinary space, as you heard from our experts. All right, that's great. Um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce. Next, we have Stephen from Zax. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Stephen. How are you? Good morning. I'd like to get a little granular in your go-to-market strategy for the uh, vet product. Um, sure. When you were looking at the um, clinical study, um, I don't have the slide in front of me, but it, what was it, like 186 uh, patients? Was that the yeah, there was 330 dogs, uh, 330, mixed between the, the okay. healthies and... Uh, um, what was the time frame for that, that amount of uh, dogs to come into the study? I'm trying to gauge how, how big the market is, how far the reach is of Texas A&M vet. Uh, so we know what kind, what kind of market you'll be addressing in Texas. Sure. Um, that's probably uh, a question for Heather. She's actually on the line. Um, Dr. Wilson Robles, can you, uh, did you hear that question and, and can you answer that? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So the, uh, the number of dogs that came in through this study was actually from a variety of different sources. Um, so there's a large uh, biobank that's run by the NCI. Um, and we were able to get uh, many of the samples through there. Um, but additionally, we collected samples internally. More of the longitudinal data has been collected internally. Um, on average, our practice alone sees about 3,000 cases a year. That's just oncology cases, certainly not what the whole hospital sees. Um, and we are one of six, uh, I'm sorry, one of eight specialty hospitals in uh, Texas. Uh, so I think there's quite a bit of resource down here and plenty of cases. Um, I think on average, there's about 6 million cases of cancer diagnosed in dogs each year. So certainly we, we feel like the market is there to support that. Um, but when we collect, as far as the time frame goes for collecting those samples, we were able to do that in a, a short period of time in a matter of like three months, uh, just because we were able to, to get some of those samples from biobanks. Did that answer your question? Uh, you have, I assume you have good relations with the other seven specialty hospitals within Texas? Uh, yes, sir. We actually trained almost all the specialists who are out there. They're residents from our program. So we, we do generally have very good relations with them. So you'll have a good outreach program to um, introduce them to the product? Uh, yes. Um, and in fact, we've reached out to many of them already to have sort of lunch and learn type uh, uh, scenarios in the next week or two uh, to hopefully kind of expand our reach and let them know what we're offering since we're hoping to offer it pretty soon. And have they seen a slowdown in business due to uh, COVID? Or I know pets no. are very important to people. Yes, we we really have not. In fact, if anything, it's picked up. I think people being home with their pets, they're actually noticing more um, illness or noticing more changes in their pet's daily routine. They're, they're paying closer attention. So um, we've actually seen an increase. And though we've been trying to hold our level at 75%, uh, for resources, we've actually been unable to do that because they're just coming through emergency. Um, so, so we and the other practices that I have talked to, veterinarians across the board, including our general practitioners, are actually busier than ever. And do you have a specific date for the launch? Not as yet, no. We're, uh, we'll, we'll outline that fully when we launch. But uh, we have a target date, and so we're just bringing everything together now. But it's, okay, uh, and I assume there would be a press release at that time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, next, we have Jason McCarthy from Maxim. Good morning, Jason. Hey, there. There's actually Michael Kunowich on for Jason. Ah, Thanks Michael, for coming. How are you? <laughs> good morning. So, actually, good morning. Um, I'd like to actually discuss a bit more about the um, the market for the veterinary product, particularly. You know, when discussing the size of the market, you already mentioned this in the call, the canine cancer market is actually a lot larger in terms of patients. So uh, I'd like to see how many diagnostic tests for cancer are run each year in terms of, you know, the scans and the biopsies, et cetera. 
I'll uh, let Heather answer that, but I'll just give you a, an overview of the market from, from our point of view. So we didn't talk about a lot on the call. We wanted to focus on the fantastic results and, and, and the product itself. But of course, everyone wants to know, like yourself, what's the market size? So the, the things I can tell you, and then Heather can uh, uh, go through the more specific details, 77 million uh, dogs in the US, um, 6 million of those get cancer, about 2 million of those uh, get the cancers that we're after. So you'd have to think if, if the product is as good as uh, it appears to be looking, uh, the market would have to be in the millions of tests per year. That's, of course, not going to happen right off the bat. This is revolutionary, a lot of education. That's probably going to be a rolling process over the next few years, if it ever happens, but I think it's a reasonable assumption. So we start with uh, one lab, one dog, and we'll see you know, if it does get into the numbers we expect it to. Um, so it'll be start off small this year. Um, we're just, as I said, one lab and, and, and the dog's there. Um, the, we've uh, <clears throat> released a price range from $1 to $200 as what we expected. I think uh, where we are now, we're just finalising all the negotiations. We're looking to be, in, because of the accuracy of the test and because it is really quite different uh, in the top half of that range, uh, in the 150 plus range, uh, the price to the, to the actual owner, of which uh, Volition would get about a third. And uh, because it's only uh, one single assay, it's extremely high margin. Um, it, it helps refund all the, the research we've been doing over the years in humans and in animals. And the reason we can do this so quickly, it can be happen so, um, it's only been a year since we formed Volition Vet. It's standing on the shoulders of all the fantastic work we've done over the years. The team has, uh, has spent a huge amount of time and effort making a very stable platform. So what we did was just ship some human kits, uh, which work in the blood cancers in humans, um, and uh, that they work in the blood cancers in dogs. So uh, two species, one test. Uh, it's worked uh, quite remarkably well. So, um, and I think it's probably, we haven't obviously have, have a human product in the US, but it's probably even further north than we would charge on the human product um, because the accuracy is, is so fantastic in these cancers. So, but it's a, it's a very affordable product also for pet owners. So uh, Heather, would you like to answer the questions on the number of scans? I'm uh, not familiar with that. Um, so by scans, are you talking about like imaging scans or just lab tests? Uh, yeah, just the general testing, Margaret, like how many people take their pets in and run a test for cancer? Sure. So I think, you know, my practice, I'm a tertiary institution. So uh, animals have to be referred to me from their primary care vet. Um, and I still see, again, around 3,000 to 3,500 cases a year. Um, I believe, gosh, it's a little hard to, to say because we don't have good ways to measure um, but I think it's a pretty large number. Uh, I talk to vets every day with consults on the phone. So just to give you an example, in my practice, we have an, on average around 20 to 25 cases who come in each day. Um, every single one of those cases will get some test, whether it's a lab test, whether it's a CT scan, whether it's an MRI, ultrasound, radiograph, something. Um, and each one of those has come from a, a general practitioner who has to usually make the diagnosis of cancer or at least have a high suspicion before they can get to me. Um, I think if you had a simple lab test that people could screen for, you would see it happen quite a bit. Uh, the majority of pet owners um, will take their pets to the vet every year for an annual wellness exam. We anticipate this being part of that annual wellness exam. And so that extends well beyond the number of dogs that are even suspected of having cancer. Mm -hmm. And just one aside, uh, you, you also asked even the, uh, the market in Texas. There are just under 5,000 vets in Texas. Uh, so it's obviously, it's, it's, uh, I love America. It's not a small market to start with. And we thought by trying to sort of uh, really dominate one market in the first few months, it makes a lot of sense to get the awareness out there where uh, Texas A&M is obviously trained a very large number of them anyway. Uh, there's a really good network and then deal across the country starting straight away on the on the specialists and in texas um so that's the way you can penetrate the market from the top and from the bottom and uh, don't forget this is our first uh platform which is the, uh, the plates um microtida plates uh, we also have beads which you know we we will be launching we expect a product on the beads and don't forget we also have a point of care um not a finger prick, I guess a paw prick in this situation. Um, so that could be used much more at a vet basis as well as well as lab. So we think there's a lot to play for here. This is the first product. Uh, we think it looks very good. We'll find out in the first few quarters what the take-up is. But if the take-up isn't what we're expecting, 
which, you know, it, it can, we don't, no one's ever done this as revolutionary. We can add more assays, we can add more cancers, we can make it easier to use. And, and there's, uh, I think it's fair to say, Heather, maybe you can comment on that. There's really no competition in the blood space for what we're doing. So I think it's, uh, we have good expectations for, we could get a really good take up in the first year or two from what we're doing. Is that fair to say, Heather? There's, uh, what is the actual competition for this, for this test? Yeah, there are no cancer screening tests currently available. There are one or two blood tests you can do once you have a diagnosis uh, for monitoring or things like that, but those, um, their accuracy levels are not as good as ours. Um, and so there's only one other test for the detection of cancer, um, which is a bladder tumor test, um, and so does not compete with us. And I think just finally on, on your question, Stephen, what, so people often say, well, why are we doing VET? Why are you doing COVID? As you heard, um, the VET market is, is bigger than, uh, than ever. We're taking incredibly good care of our, of our dogs. Uh, we're still very, very serious about our lung and colorectal work, but you know, we've just had spectacular results with a, keeping simplicity at the heart of what we can do during COVID. One single assay, 97% accuracy is really quite remarkable. And uh, low cost, I said just uh, you know, under $5 to manufacture one, one, one test is, is quite remarkable. So given the fact that it works extremely well in blood cancer, given that's a very common cancer in dogs, given this is one assay we have had ready in the human market, ready for product, and it's uh, exactly the same in the in product in the vet market, just seemed like a complete no-brainer when it could easily grow over, over years into several million tests a year. And if we're making $40 profit on a, out of the $50 we get from it, it's... It's incredibly good uh, revenue. Again, it won't start, it's gonna be a, a curve as we grow, but it's, it's a fantastic market and one that can really set the scene for all, all our other markets in the COVID space and the human cancers. No, thank you. Definitely, definitely a big market opportunity here. Um, I'd like to switch gears and do one more if you don't mind. I'd like to um, ask you this time about the, uh, the two trials you mentioned for blood cancers in the near future. You have the one coming up that's the, uh, the regulatory trial in non-Hodgkin's. Um, yes. What's the timeline on that? Is that one uh, underway now or in the near future? And then the second study, the smaller one in treatment response, is that one also a registration or is that a more early state? I'll just give a quick answer, then Jason can give a more in-depth answer as our chief medical officer and organizing these trials. Um, yeah, since the results have come in uh, so, so high in the blood cancers, just with a single assay. Now, again, we've got great results in the past in different cancers, but we've never got results uh, that are at the best in class test by itself just with one single assay. It's quite remarkable um, in the human and the dog blood cancer space. We thought we should get serious about some uh, trials in those spaces. That's why we're adding them on now. Uh, and Dr. Terrell has put together these two trials in the US, one a 510K regulatory and the other one as a proof of concept. Um, so we can launch products so, so this, this, this test has already got the C mark in Europe, which is the, the human C mark we have got for the blood cancers. Now we're looking to use that C mark kit for US regulatory trials. Now US regulatory trials obviously take a lot longer in the human space than in dogs, but we've had great uh, data in the human space for these same cancers. Again, the difference with the other cancers, we've got great results in the other cancers, but we needed quite a big panel, which is tough to do in, in these times. So Jason, uh, do you want any specific answers to those questions? Um, yeah, just regarding the timeline uh, for the FDA regulatory study, the total duration is 22 months. Uh, the actual trial itself is just 18, but of course there's, there's two months on the front end and then two months on the back end. And although that's a large, um, you know, extended period trial, um, it does include all eight of the most common subtypes. Um, so what we plan to do is take the few large B cell, which as I explained is by far the most common. And because it's 35% uh, of all the cases, we, were, we will accrue uh, patients in the few large B cell much more quickly. So we'll read statistically significant numbers of the few large B cell long before we will the others. So we anticipate somewhere in the 10 to 12 months is when we'll reach that magic number that would satisfy the, the FDA for a 510K specific for the fused large B cell. So we, we hope to file uh, that at that time. And then while we are speaking to the FDA and presenting this study, uh, we'll show the intro data that we have for the more rare subtypes and request that uh, they accept subsequent 510Ks as those numbers also accrue. 
And um, when it comes to the therapy monitoring study, um, that's, that's not an FDA study. It's not a regulatory trial. It's actually the first time we've looked at uh, anything in therapy monitoring. Uh, so it's a much earlier stage. Uh, but the good thing about that is it's already begun collecting and it's just a six month duration. So it's, it's, it's a pretty rapid trial. We hope to have some results soon. Um, and then when we do um, proceed into regulatory trials with that, they, they will be 510Ks. So um, much more abbreviated versus the, the traditional PMA. And Jason, while we're on the topic, could you just uh, explain to the listeners, um, as a medical doctor, uh, a chief medical officer, who, who, come, who would come into your practice as a general practitioner, who you'd give this test to and why, if the trial is successful in the human blood cancers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, making the diagnosis of blood cancer, especially lymphoma, it's, mm -hmm. it's very tricky. Um, and the reason is because <clears throat> the specifics are nonspecific and they're very generalized. So a patient with blood cancer would present to you and they would say, I, I have fatigue, I have fever, maybe I have, you know, a swollen lymph node or two. Um, and, and that's certainly not specific for blood cancer. In fact, that could be any number of things across um, you know, a variety of different pathologies and disease conditions, everything from, you know, strep throat, uh, to autoimmune disease. Um, so so the problem with blood cancer is it's not easy to diagnose and certainly not easy to, to diagnose quickly because what physicians do is they tend to treat the things that are very common. So they may prescribe a course of antibiotics and ask the patient to follow up you know, a week or two later if they're not improved. And if it's um, an early stage blood cancer, of course, they don't improve with, with standard routine therapies. Um, they return to the office a week or two later, they're still sick. And then you start to rule out, um, you know, other things that it could be. And then eventually you get to the point where you have a higher index of suspicion for, for blood cancer because everything else has, has been ruled out. Um, and, and, and when you go to make the diagnosis of blood cancer, it requires the patient be referred um, to oncology and pathology for a biopsy. Um, so obviously you don't want to order a biopsy the first time you see a patient when they complain of general symptoms, otherwise you'd be biopsying, you know, multiple patients a day. Um, so that's, that's what this test will do is it's something that will be a blood test, simple, easy to use on that very first patient encounter, um, when you don't necessarily have a high index of suspicion for blood cancer, but it's always in the back of your mind and it's always, you know, worrisome and, and, and of some concern. So if you can give our blood test on that first encounter, and if the results come back very high, then you can immediately refer this patient to biopsy. You can immediately get the diagnosis and immediately begin treatment. And early treatment is, is key in blood cancers because it's, it's a very aggressive disease. Um, it can kill you very rapidly, but it responds well to treatment. So we, we want to decrease that time to diagnosis um, as much as possible. And when you're dealing with, a, with an aggressive form of blood cancer, you know, two, three, four weeks, um, that can be the difference in life or death. Thank you. That's very helpful. So I think uh, for all those reasons, uh, Michael, we think the uh, blood cancer market in dogs and in humans are uh, potentially very large and something with a very simple assay, uh, the simplest panel we've ever put together, uh, could be a really good uh, addition to the market. And unlike the other cancers, uh, it's a really an open space in the blood cancers in humans and in dogs, because there really is nothing else. So it's a great place to start with a very simple test. A any other questions, Michael? Uh, no, that's all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Yep. Next is Mark from Opp Oppenheimer. Hi. Uh, can, you, can you guys hear me? Fantastic. Good, good morning. Hi, Cameron. Uh, so, so two questions for me. Um, first, maybe one directed to Dr. Wilson Robos. Um, um, so, as you know, in, in 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 humans, there are several types of lymphoma, and I realize in, in dogs there are several subtypes as well. And and I'm just wondering if if the diagnostic performance that you're detecting that you've reported is dependent at all on the subtype of lymphoma. And the second part of the question is, I, I thought it was really interesting that you, you see. Uh, nucleosome levels or circulating nucleosome levels as a potential early indicator of, of relapse or, or recurrence. Um, do you think that would apply to humans as well as dogs? Yeah, so, uh, Heather, do you want to take the first one and then Jason take the second one on the uh, relapse? Heather? 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. I think, so we do have all the same subtypes uh, in dogs that they do have in humans. Um, our pathologists don't always label them exactly the same way, but they do exist. Um, and like humans, diffuse large B cell lymphoma is by far our most common. I think what's different is that diffuse large B cell lymphoma actually represents about 70% of the lymphomas, uh, B cell lymphomas that we see, and B cell lymphomas are 70% of the lymphomas that we see. So, so I think diffuse large B cell lymphoma is actually quite a bit more common. Uh, and part of that is because non hot or because Hodgkin's based lymphomas really for all practical purposes don't exist in the dog. We see, you know, there's the maybe once a year case report that comes out. So it's really uncommon. They, they're more likely to get the more aggressive forms. Um, we do see a difference. So B cell lymphomas do tend to have a higher uh, median nucleosome level than our T cell lymphomas. Uh, and we've tested a few indolent, a handful of indolent lymphomas like T zone lymphomas that do seem to, to test pretty low, close to the normal range. Both the, the median T cell and B cell lymphoma uh, nucleosome levels are above uh, those healthy dogs with a few exceptions, uh, but the majority of those guys would still be picked up on the test. But we do probably because of the amount of gross disease in B cell is so much higher than T cells in many cases, we do see higher nucleosome levels in those. Thank you, Thank you Heather. And Jason, uh, could this be also used in uh, treatment selection therapy monitoring in human space? Um, <clears throat> yes, absolutely. That's uh, the purpose of the trial where we've begun collecting now is to um, look at therapy monitoring. Um, we haven't looked more at treat. We haven't looked necessarily at treatment selection yet. That's something that could kind of follow on to um, the current study, but um, in theory, absolutely it could be very helpful. And I think Mark, just a quick one on the market. <clears throat> so when you talk about there's millions of dogs, we think, from the screening market. But if you also do, uh, do the treatments and therapy monitoring selection, it's a serial sample. So you might give the test to the dog five or seven or eight times um, in, in, one, in one series. So it's obviously a, a smaller market because you're not screening, but many more per dog. So potentially a, a very lucrative large market. As you can see, that it was an N of two dogs. So uh, we have to do a lot more work. But it was as encouraging as it could have been from the two we have got. So we're doing a lot more in the human and the, uh, the, the vet space. But just to be clear, the product as today is just for the cancer screening test. Um, we need to do more work before we launch it or advise uh, anyone uses it in the monitoring space. Got it. Um, that's, that's super helpful. And I did want to ask one question on the, the colorectal screening product, which I know we didn't talk about too much this morning. So, so as you're aware, on, on Friday, the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released a, a draft decision memo um, uh, describing the requirements for coverage for blood-based blood colorectal can um, uh, cancer screening tests. Uh, and in that memo, there were sensitivity and specificity thresholds detailed of, of 74 and 90% respectively. So, you know, with that in mind, are, are these um, performance metrics achievable with your commercial grade assays? Um, uh, and, and does this draft memo at all impact your development strategy or timeline for your asymptomatic CRC screening product in the US? Yeah, actually interesting, Mark. I think what it did do was really reiterate we've made a very wise decision not to launch a product before it was a very high accuracy. Uh, <clears throat> it's obviously been a lot of pressure from a lot of different groups over the years, just launch, just launch. Um, you can see when we are launching products now, they're at excellent sensitivity and specificity and uh, can be really a market winner. So uh, if we had 89% or 97% with one assay in the colorectal market, then we you know, would be launching. But uh, it's always taken a few assays to get to levels you need to get to. So, uh, and that really, I think, validates our strategy of getting the platform really stable. When we get the accuracy in a cancer or a product, or like potentially the COVID, or any of the cancers in human space, it has to be high and has to be you know, either best in class or really help with something. So uh, the, the colorectal, we've talked about a lot. It's taken, uh, it takes a bigger panel. We've never got 97% with one assay, that's for sure, um, which is why <clears throat> we're launching the blood cancers now. But we're working very heavily on our, in our colorectal program. Um, and uh, it has been paused, the collection. We're not doing colonoscopies during, uh, during the COVID time. So as of today, uh, we do not have a panel uh, ready for a product which meets those specifications. But we're working on it very hard, and we're very hopeful we will have. So that's why we've been working on things where we can have an extremely big market with a, with a very simple test that we can launch today. 
And that's why exactly why we're focused on COVID, on, on the blood cancers in humans and in dogs. Because right now, we have something which can really, really dominate the market and be extremely profitable. So we'll, we'll keep updates. Uh, obviously, the US trial is paused, so there's not much we can do in the moment. We do have the Asian samples still collecting from Taiwan. So we'll have more data on, on that coming up. And, and we're very confident we'll get to a product. Um, and, the, and the specificities of that we'll have to work out once we have all those final details. But uh, I'd like to reiterate, we're very, very serious about our lung and colorectal programs. Um, but just they just take more work. So we're working on them now and we'll, we'll update everything. But I think it does validate our strategy of, of waiting to launch until we really have something special in every, in, in every category. Okay, thanks for taking the questions. Thank you, Mike. Next, we have Nathan from Aegis. Good morning, Cameron and the Volition team. So thanks for hosting this uh, wonderful event today. We learned uh, quite a bit. Got to see some more of the vet side, so that's great. And um, just a couple questions from me. So we know vets are very social uh, by nature and they talk amongst themselves. So early on in the launch, if you're just a normal vet in another geography outside Texas, um, you know, can they get access to your product or how will they sort of participate? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, but uh, Heather, do you want to describe how that would work? How, how could they send a sample to the lab in Texas? Sure. So the GI lab is a national lab. They receive over 15,000 samples a week um, just for their GI uh, lab tests alone. And so any veterinarian will be able to order any test from the GI lab just like they currently are able to do so. So if they hear about the test, they want to use it, they'll be able to get onto the GI lab website just as if they were ordering any other test from the GI lab and order our test. So we're not limiting it and saying veterinarians outside of Texas can't have access to it. We're merely saying that we're going to try to focus our marketing on those guys in Texas because they have the closest relationship with the GI lab first. Um, however, if some vet in Washington uh, state wants to order the test, they will certainly be able to do so. And if they need any help um, interpreting the results or understanding what those results mean, we'll be there to, to help them understand that. And, and that's actually a, a key thing to, uh, to really get across. So we're starting with Texas. And as Heather said, uh, any, any vet theoretically who has a relationship or can, can get the test done. Um, we decided, obviously, never, no one's ever done this for a small organization. We're starting where we have a, a real strength in Texas. But as you add new labs, um, you have a, a mailing list that goes out to all their current clients. They start publicizing in their areas. So you begin to get hotspots across the country. Um, but theoretically, as, as Heather said, anyone could send it into the, the Texas lab now. But as you uh, develop more and more uh, awareness and more and more labs, you generate it through a national sort of awareness campaign with the clinical oncologists and with vets. And the labs themselves become, obviously, they want to sell more of their own products. And we've also been very careful to make sure the labs and, and everyone involved, including the vets, get um, a reasonable return from their work as well, because um, a, a test is quite simple. Um, it's something where we can charge a low cost and still make sure everyone is properly remunerated all the way through. So I think it's a, a very good outcome for everyone. And, and we're not exactly sure what the first labs look like. We just want to get the first one right. Um, any teething problems in one lab, not five or 10, get, the, get it moving and get awareness. And then we'll roll out quite aggressively after that once we're very comfortable in the stability in that one lab, the process, you know, all the things we have to do. We want to make sure we get right in a, in a very close to home basis. So it's, uh, we'll have a lot more news throughout next year as we roll out more labs. We'll start with one. Great. Thank you, uh, Cameron and Heather. That's clear. And just the final uh, follow up in terms of the resources uh, that Volition will need in terms of both financial and then headcount. Uh, how are you guys situated uh, going into the launch? Yeah, very well. So we have a, a, a few more hires we're going to be working on. Um, it's not, it's like a handful of people uh, for the first few quarters. Uh, we don't, uh, to reiterate a few things, uh, Silver One, our new facility in Belgium, is uh, just about operational. Uh, we, we brought in-house the key components, which are also the key components for the vet space. So the, the original kits we're using in the vet space are actually the human kits, which are CE marked. So we're using the top quality uh, products on the dogs as well as humans. We take care of our four-legged friends and we aim to start manufacturing in our own facility uh, by the middle of next year. And the price will come down quite a bit as well. So the margin will go more from kind of 80s to sort of high 80s, which will also really help. And then we can really control everything. So I think we've got it all covered. Um, so the headcount, not a lot. And, and I don't think... We, we don't intend to run our own lab. We don't intend to have our own vet shops or specialists. So 
um, which means we get about a third of the total value, but we don't have to have a huge infrastructure. And that's exactly on our model in the human space. Keep it virtual, do the things we do best, which is the research, the assay development, and producing the very basic kits uh, internally, but it's not a lot of work. But also, as we roll out, we're intending to have it on magnetic beads for the big machines, as well as on beads. So as you also uh, heard Heather say, uh, this is, uh, looks very promising in a range of other species, like cats um, and, <laughs> as you said, even lions and other things. So we'd expect to do a lot more work, not just in the dog space, but in other animals. So I think there's a huge amount ahead of us, but we want to start very carefully to make sure we, we have a very good launch and uh, get everyone on side before we really start the big rollout in the first few months of next year. Cameron, thanks so much. Thank you for your time. So I think that's everyone now. No more, no more Alice. So thank you very much. It's been a, um, um, a very good uh, call. Thanks for all your time and effort. Uh, our queue is just in a few weeks. It'll be around the middle of November. Uh, we'll have a lot more updates in there in all of our other programs. Um, our focus on the early products does not mean in any way, shape or form. We're not doing a massive amount of work on the capture, on the lung, the colorectal, all those other things. We'll have a lot of up, more updates on COVID in the short term, our COVID potential product, and uh, also on Silver One, our production facility, and also as we roll out the blood cancers in humans and in dogs and expect an update uh, when we actually do launch, which we do expect to be this year, uh, the, when the first dogs are uh, using our tests, which will be a huge milestone for the company. It's been 10 years now. Um, we've developed a platform from absolute scratch with a small team and a relatively small budget. And uh, I really could not be happier or proud of how the team has gone in turning this uh, dream that we had 10 years ago to make a fantastic epigenetic platform and uh, we can really see now in the very wide uses it can be used, and we intend to take advantage of a lot of them in short to medium term. So thanks again, and thank you for your time and efforts.